the scroll bar you should see at the bottom great yeah. hi everybody welcome to innovations in game-based learning we are here with our last webinar in our series this semester and um last but certainly not least our very special um guests today mark Suter and steve isaacs my dear friends and colleagues i'm so um, happy to hang out with you guys and hear from you today um, for those of you that are joining us in chat, please feel free to back channel chat throughout the talk. If you have questions or answers, there's a little Q&A box um, underneath. If you checkmark that, it'll be sure to pull out your questions as we go. And then we can prompt Steve or Mark with your questions if they don't catch them. So at this point, I'm going to turn us over to our co-host, Beatrix, um, who I thank for all her very hard work coordinating these webinars um, to introduce Steve and Mark. Oh, thanks, Lisa. So um, I'm very happy to present Steve and Mark. They have a really great rapport. I think we're going to have a really great talk today. Um, so Steve Isaacs, he's an educator with 25 years of experience um, in GBL and game design, and he's the producer of Mindfair, which is a huge Minecraft fan experience. And uh, Mark Suter is, uh, teaches high school computer tech courses. And his students are developing VR apps in Unity um, for the HTC Vive. And it seems like they're just doing a lot of really exciting projects. So with that, I hand over to Steve and Mark. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I'm going to open up our little, uh, there we go. Can everybody see those okay? They see the VR AR thing there. What's that? Awesome. Yep, good. Just making sure they can see the slides there. Yeah, we can see everything. Excellent. So. Like Robin and Lisa said, I'm, I'm in Ohio, Steve's over in Jersey, um, but we both met uh, in an online degree program at Boise State and we've been kind of doing this stuff together. So if, if you guys get start getting into this stuff and um, need some help, feel free to reach out to myself um, and probably Steve too. So Steve, why don't you introduce yourself? I would be happy to Mark, thank you. Um, so my name is Steve Isaacs. I teach game design and development at William Adam Middle School, which is um, a public middle school in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Uh, and one of the things uh, that both Mark and I have been involved with for a few years is a research study on virtual reality in the classroom with Foundry 10, uh, which is a wonderful organization out in Seattle that studies um, non-traditional approaches to learning, which uh, anything that any organization that says they, they study non-traditional approaches to learning uh, scores high in my book. So... You know, it's been really amazing to be part of that. And that's what our focus of our conversation will be, obviously, today. True. Um, so that's that's the Foundry 10 there. You can go on there and watch the video there. Um, we were uh, trying to keep this to, what, 30 to 45 minutes is what we were told. So I don't think we'll have time to show all the videos, you think, Steve? Um, and also, there's that link. I don't know where the feedback's coming from because I don't have speakers. Yeah, and I don't, I don't hear it. Um, if other people do, definitely let us know. Yeah. I'm hit, uh, let's go back to that one slide. I just want to get that, share that link with people because uh, that's some from our sessions over the summer. Um, we gave a series of resources, uh, and I think it's a Google Doc, if I remember. And it, it basically just has some creation tools for VR, which are things that Mark and I have been, you know, kind of dabbling with and continuing to to work with. So. You know, one of the things uh, we've been thinking a whole lot about through our, our research and, you know, so one thing I'll say, Mark and I happen to be, um, you know, we both kind of teach a lot of similar things in terms of game design and, and design thinking and iteration and my favorite word and all that kind of stuff. And so for both of us, at least, um, when we entered the study, one of the things we were so interested in was the idea of having kids have the ability um, to create content in virtual reality. And that's, you know, kind of where we're, we're moving towards. And, you know, when we first started, a lot of it, you know, dealt with um, the, you know, kind of like the wow factor of VR, which um, I still love. I still think it's fantastic for kids to get that and other, you know, people, educators and, and things that come into my room to play with VR. I think that's important. But uh, our kind of goal over the last year or so has to been been to move from that uh, wow to how, and and get our kids involved in creating. 
And one of the super cool things, I think, is that we have kids, you know, I guess between us, eighth through 12th grade, that uh, have this unique experience and unique opportunity to be really at the, you know, the forefront of, of the growth of this industry. I mean, VR is really kind of, um, you know, making its mark now. And so for kids to be able to see how content is created and actually uh, muddle through a lot of the bad content that out, that's out there now, because, and, and some great, but, but a lot of it to realize kind of how this, we're at the beginning of this is, is exciting. And I just have a few pictures there of some of the kinds of tools that uh, we can work with our kids with in terms of AR and VR. One is uh, Unity, which I know Mark will even talk more about as he has more experience uh, with his students. There's also the, the Unreal Engine up there. So both of those are really professional grade tools that, uh, that are being used in the industry, probably the premier game design and VR tools. Um, I threw a couple other pictures there. One, the one on the left is called um, Meta, the Metaverse app. And it, I, I had, if you look that up, um, I think the, the Twitter handle is probably Metaverse app. The folks over there um, are very excited about, you know, getting their, their tool in education. So I had a nice one-on-one -on -one session with somebody there who, who showed me some cool stuff in the app that you could do. And it's all AR kind of stuff. And Mark just lost all his lights, and but it looks cool. Don't worry. Um, so, but the the neat thing, I don't know if anybody um, watches Silicon Valley here, but the uh, and give a little shout out in the tweet if you do, in the uh, in the chat if you do. It's a great show. So you might know the um, the not hot dog app that they talk about in that show. Well, in about fifteen minutes in the demo. The guy at Metaverse One uh, showed me how to create our own not hot dog app. And it was very fascinating to kind of see the idea of being able to, you know, very easy drag and drop type stuff, take a picture of a not hot dog or a hot dog and have it come back and tell me whether or not it was in fact a hot dog, um, you know, and the, the, the possibilities there are endless. And the other one uh, I'm sharing there is CoSpaces. And they're really making a good move into education in terms of trying to provide educators with easy tools to create virtual learning environments for students. And what's kind of neat about those two, um, the Metaverse app and CoSpaces, is that they're not going to demand the highest end technology, um, which, you know, Mark and I are fortunate. We have some pretty great equipment. But if you're talking about doing things with a whole class and things, you're going to, you know, it's going to be a challenge. So when you do have access to like Google Cardboard or your phone, that's where I think AR is going to really come in and the, the VR experiences that you can do on that lightweight kind of um, environment will be great as well. So, you know, the, the hopefully we can, you know, share a lot about how, you know, while there's awesome stuff for the higher end, there's also very accessible uh, options. So, so Steve was talking about the accessibility and that has been an incredible um, the, the change over the last last year or so because now this is what you're looking at here is a tutorial that my students and I in the intro to programming class were trying to tackle just a year ago and it's a daunting task and you can look up this tutorial it's a great tutorial but the whole purpose of this tutorial is to be able to pick up a virtual item using the HTC Vive controller and be able to pick it up and drop it and that's it and it took us weeks and at the end of the semester, one of my students was able to do that. That was a year ago. And now just, you know, months later, we now use a tool called VRTK, the Virtual Reality Toolkit, which has completely revolutionized how quickly my students can, Steve, iterate through their different designs and um, concepts, which I have some pictures of. So we finally can now, in my intro to programming class, in a matter of, hi, Enrique, in a matter of, a week or two, they can do what it took us an entire semester to do just a year ago. Because all the, this screenshot of Unity here where it says is grabbable, that was that code that we were trying to do. And now it's a checkbox, which is really lower the bar. Um, and so now they can create a little room like this. That little cage you see is the area that you'd be able to walk around in uh, in the VR that the user can go inside and, and move around in. 
uh, which is great. And we uh, start making VR apps. And this is one that we started to make um, in the last semester, the trailer backing simulator. Don't take that idea. That's our idea. <laughs> You're going to be able to use your Vive controllers to back a trailer back up into a barn. So we're actually looking at this from a perspective of creating things that are not just games that are really fun. We're actually looking at it from a training perspective. Um, and I saw my wife struggling to back a trailer up, and I thought, you know what? It would be <laughs> great to be able to practice this in a less threatening environment where you're not going to damage something. So I brought that idea to my students, and they latched onto it. And so I said, why don't we, instead of creating games, what if we created VR apps in Unity? And so we started prototyping. So the top left there, those girls are doing an oil change app. That's what they would look at underneath the car, and you see the little drip pan there with a the bolt in it. Um, in the top right, it's kind of hard to see, but they're doing what a new driver sees as the interface to a car and how to turn on the wipers and the brights and the blinkers and all that kind of stuff. Um, in the bottom left, uh, they're teaching how to jump a car battery. They all seem to be automotive related. I think hmm. they kind of did that on their own. I didn't force them into that. Um, but jumping a car battery, battery and then the bottom right is, uh, that's a little gas pump there with a the little wire on the side of it because the new drivers all said they were kind of intimidated doing the gas pump because they didn't know how to pump gas. And so I asked, the original question was, do you want to do something that's going to matter to other people or do you want to make a game that might be kind of fun? And they unanimously wanted to do something that would actually help other people, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and so just this semester, in the nine weeks that we've been in an intro to programming class, they came in with zero experience. And the bar is low enough that now you can see in the bottom left there, the one girl's laying on her back. Because in their app, you have to lay underneath the car to change the oil. You're, it's not like you're in like a professional place where you have a bay underneath it. So they're setting up their car so that underneath it, you have to use the correct wrench to use things um, or to take the, the uh, bolts off. Um, in the top right there, that guy's doing one uh, changing a car tire. And again, very accessible. And it's encouraging them because they're using the basic scripting that instead of just saying, oh, why don't you add these integers together and float numbers and Boolean hmm. uh, variables. And now they're like, oh, wow, we really need to know how to keep score and develop a graphical user interface and, and things like that. So it's it's been great experience so far. Here's my favorite word again. Yes. Um, so, you know, one of the things I always kind of bring up is, um, yes, iterative, iterative, um, iterative design. Um, everything that I do in my class revolves around iterative design. Um, you know, basically, I, I, you know, I always like to share the process because with what we're doing with with game design and with VR, um, you know, follows the same idea. I'm sure Mark can vouch for that with all those cool um simulations they're dealing with. I'm sure there's so much iteration. Um, and, you know, so so this is kind of the model. But um, this picture that I have on the right here, you know, one great example I had a couple of years ago was a student who, um, it was one of those weird situations where this kid wasn't doing that much in my class. And, you know, wasn't a problem. But he, I also kind of saw him as being this unmotivated kind of kid. Oh, we'll go Sorry. back to that one. No, no problem. No problem. Um, so the, uh, so he heard that, so he had this game at home called um, No Limits Coaster. And um, at one point I had downloaded it for VR because it was like this, it's a CAD program where you create roller coasters and theme parks and stuff. And then you ride your coasters, you know, in VR and it, um, you know, deals with physics, all that great stuff. Um, and I didn't know he had this game at home. So I had mentioned that this was an option for virtual reality and, you know, this kid's eyes light up and all of a sudden, you know, I also, you know, kind of value the 20% time or genius hour idea. So in my class, it's all about choice. So this kid, once he latched onto this, this became like his project and final project and, and beyond for the rest of the semester. And it was super cool. Um, oh, so you don't, do other people hear me? It's a, okay. Sorry, Lynn. I would love for Lynn to hear me. Um, so, uh, so anyway, like a nightingale. <laughs> Thank you, Enrique. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, 
So he started building these coasters and then um, he would then all of a sudden show up to lunch with like a friend that wasn't in my class. And he'd, he'd ask, Hey, can, can my friend ride my roller coaster? And this became a thing and it was, you know, super cool. And up here, I'm going to share a video. Um, if I can find it, it's up the chat a bit. Let's see here. Um, should be finding it. Wow. There's a lot more chatting than I thought going on here. Let's see. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Uh, that's not it. Rats. Which one are you looking for? Uh, I'm just about got it. Don't do anything. Oh, mess it. me up with that. You see it? This one, this YouTube one, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste it down here. Um, feel free to watch this, you know, either now or later, but um, what's cool is then this kid, you know, like I always have my kids publish some kind of way of sharing the work they had done. Um, if it's a game that other people can, can try, then the game itself gets published. So this was actually, I think he was able to publish these to the steam workshop but uh, he also created this video that kind of highlights his journey with this. And it became this great project because if you take a few minutes to watch it later, I mean, he incorporated cool music and showed all his coasters. Uh-oh, 404 not found for the, for the YouTube video. All right, I'll, I'll find it when Mark's talking later and I'll post it up there. Um, but anyway, it's really good, trust me. And he, you know, just went to town with this. So it was really awesome. And we'll go on now. Um, you know, and then moving towards, you know, the idea of, of importing content, you know, for VR, in that case, he was using a tool that what he did immediately ported into VR, which was great. But when we get into, um, unity and stuff, we, there are all these great tools now to import, uh, import content from. So I just wanted to share some of those. And I think these are in that original document we shared, but Sketchfab has amazing, um, you know, works of art that you could bring into Unity and explore in VR. Um, Tinkercad as well. And the kids creating in Tinkercad, if you've played around with Tinkercad, it's a very easy program to use. So now kids can very easily create their own 3D structures and import them right into, um, you know, Unity or other tools. Um, it's funny that you put castles in there because I ironically also was creating castles, but I was creating them in SketchUp. So it used to be a Google product um, now by a different company. But um, if you go on the SketchUp uh, website, if you want to export the 3D models, you can get a free professional license. Um, if you just Google SketchUp and at the bottom look under education, you send them an email um, and they send you a pro license, which allows you to export the OBJ file, which after you make these things and SketchUp is beautiful too, just like Tinkercad, um, maybe even more geared towards professionals, mm -hmm. um, kind of a medium. It's not quite AutoCAD complicated. I actually think it's, it's very simple. I used to teach it to sixth graders, um, but you can go quickly from making that. And then this is in unity. It imports very cleanly. Um, so you can imagine the kid making something like, uh, modeling their house or a room they're familiar with in the real world, and then they could actually use that in VR. I keep looking over here because that's where our VR setup is. There's the Vive uh -huh. controller there, uh, or sensor there. So, um, so yeah, SketchUp has been a great tool to allow students to. That's what when they make their um, like the oil change app that the girls are doing. Um, the SketchUp has a warehouse. So a lot of people get caught up in, well, I can't create all this 3D content. Well, you don't really need to. If you just want to be able to do the fun part of programming it or designing the gameplay, SketchUp has a warehouse, and I imagine Tinker does too. So, <laughs> so um, now we're going to talk a little bit about AR. Um, so I don't know if you could really, I mean, hopefully you can see what that picture is, but that's my daughter looking very surprised at the pig in a pen that's next to her on the table as she's doing her homework the other day. Um, and uh, 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 full disclosure, the pig in the pen, not really there. She's uh, looking at the table, um, doing a very fine job at that because I, I mean, I think it looks like she's looking at the pig in the pen, but um, this was done with, um, with mine, with, <laughs> with Minecraft. Um, and now what you can do is you can export models in Minecraft in 3d and then use them in a host of, of different ways. Here's another example. This was awesome. Um, this is Katya Beauregard, who is uh, one of the Minecraft mentors. And her project's a little more impressive than my pig in a pen in that it um, these kids designed 
a, I believe it was an eco-friendly car, and there they are, you know, posing with their car in the real world. Again, car not really there, um, but uh, but it sure looks like it is. Um, that that was that was like right at the beginning of when this tool came out, and I thought it was just super cool that she was uh, got her kids, you know, using it and doing neat stuff and and being able to show what they really developed. Um, just to kind of show you how how simple this is too for any Minecrafters out there, and it looks like we've got a, a good bunch of them in our in our in our list here. I know Noah and Lynn. Um, Lynn probably knows probably knows this, but I don't know if she's done it in uh, the Education Edition yet. But in Minecraft Education Edition and Windows 10, now there's uh, something called structure blocks. So basically, this is a block that when I place it and and right click it. Um, I can basically determine what what uh, picture based relative to where my structure block is. What do I want to grab from the environment? So in this simple example, I was um, just basically went five out on the X and Z plane to create a square that's five by five and two up in the Y um, plane. So if you see, you know, it was just two blocks high and then a five by five. And then, you know, you export that. And you can then use that uh, in a number of places. That, and, which is one of the things too, I think, where we were talking before about why this is um, kind of exploding now is that it's finally super accessible. So exporting that that um, was not complicated, right? Now immediately it saved that file as a GBL uh, or GLB file, I think it is, which is I think a native one of the, the 3D structure um, formats. You can open that right in either Paint 3D and do stuff with it, manipulate it, or the Mixed Reality Viewer, which is becoming one of my favorite just fun tools. So here it is in the Mixed Reality Viewer, and there it's just imported. But then when you go to more thing to do more with 3D or with, yeah, in this, then it basically um, opens up, you know, as long as you have a camera, it opens up the the camera on your device and you can place this object anywhere in you know the real and world mixed reality viewer is a windows app steve yeah yep it's a free uh app that and paint 3d both i believe come with the creators update in windows 10 okay um oh the creators update okay yeah 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 so and lynn absolutely let's get the ant in in my classroom i, I see a horror situation happening with that huge ant um you got to see that uh, lynn if you ever get a chance to see some of the work that lynn does in minecraft talk about mind-blowing um incredible stuff she's done a lot of really neat stuff all over but uh she's on our our mind fair server she's created some cool 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 stuff um so uh, I, I'm in awe, but anyway, there's my little pig in a pen, you know, not quite as <laughs> impressive. Nice, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then it just gets me starting to think, um, you know, the possibilities, right? So here's, you know, kind of the next thing I think we're going to, and this might already be out for all I know, but here it looks like this dude's got his um, watch or something on that has a projector that is, you know, putting a little keyboard on his wrist, uh, Again, like with my pig and a pen, the keyboard is not really there, um, but he can use it functionally, and it's uh, projecting out too. So I mean, it's like you know when we start to think about AR and mixing reality and all, um, you know, we're really opening that space in a in a tremendous way that uh, that I think we can capitalize in a big way in education. And I always love to talk about this kind of concept of of how much do we need to know, and uh, I, I, you know, I think Mark probably would, would, would share the sentiment. A lot of what, what we do, or definitely what I do is, I mean, for one, we're always learning my, you know, I haven't used a, a textbook in, in the 20 or so years I've been in, in my current position. Um, and you know, I love learning, right? So I'm learning all the time, but at the same time, what I've become very accustomed to is learning with my students. So, um, you know, you know, I'm starting to dabble just enough, but then I'll hand things over to my kids and be like, hey, I just found this tool and you can, um, you know, use it. So Edorable and Unity, there was a great uh, little, very simple online class. I think it was like $10. 
that just got me my feet wet with importing structures and doing things in Unity. And eDorable is one of those platforms that you can create kind of like co-spaces, but you can create education spaces or, you know, like learning spaces that you could bring, you know, your class into or what have you. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. But, you know, that got me started with Unity. Um, the Unity in Education team, I couldn't be more excited right now. Um, I don't know if anybody knows um, Eric Martin or Jessica Lindell, but um, I don't know if that was Udacity, actually. It was, I think, their own course. Um, but anyway, the uh, Eric Martin, uh, who, was do, who was doing it, he's, while he was still in college, he was doing this great internship at the Office of Ed Tech um, for the Office of the Department of Education. And he was doing amazing things as like this 22-year-old kid. Now he's probably, you know, all of maybe 25 or 26. And he's now the, um, the director of, of education for Unity, um, which is just incredible because he's, he's a tremendous uh, fan and, and ally of game-based learning. So to start to see Unity putting that kind of um, resources and ener energy into that is fantastic. Also, um, Jessica Lindell, who you may know from uh, Glass Labs and such, she's, I think, the director of worldwide education for Unity now. So um, it's a great time to be getting, you know, involved with the Unity team and and looking at what they're doing. Uh, they're definitely looking to pull educators in and all that kind of stuff. So, um, Steve, you know, can check I add out one thing on there? Um, I just posted in the chat there. Um, there's the company called, well, the software is called uh, Ready, the GetReady.io. I just put in the chat. I've been having some phone calls with them, and Unity is working directly with them to attract the 10 to 14 year old market uh, to be future Unity uh, developers. And so if you make things in this Ready app, that's a very visual language like Scratch or Game Maker or any of those, and then export directly into Unity, which is the only software of its kind to do this. So wow. I just thought that was worth mentioning. I don't have a slide on it, but. Yeah, um, that, yeah, and that that's um, the other thing which is really worth mentioning. Uh, Unity is free for education. So it's like the equivalent of whatever their professional license is. It's like full on everything from what I understand um, for education, which is free. Um, and then, you know, just I'll just tap into a few more things, then I'll, I'll hand it back over to Mark. But, you know, now we're getting to a point too where VR is, you know, becoming very social and there are all these environments where you can create your own content. Um, there's like High Fidelity, which is the people or the guy who started Second Life. That's one environment you can work in. Facebook has its own Facebook spaces. Um, Sanzar, I, I mean, like just all these really neat, uh, I, Rec Room is like a game uh, pro a program that you can, um, you know, like social in a rec, rec hall of a college campus. Yeah. But it's multiple. Have you played, have you played any of the like paintball or anything oh, in yeah. there? Yeah. That one's free too. Right. Right. So there's a lot of neat stuff going on there. I don't know what I had there. All right. It's all you, Mark. I think. <laughs> cool. So, um, as far as implementation goes, I mean, the cheapest way to go, if you're going to do real good VR, um, and I should say good VR. I should say if you're going to use Unity to create for VR, the VRTK toolkit that I was showing earlier um, works natively with uh, Oculus, um, the Open Protocol, and then the HTC Vive and a few others. But um, so one thing that we did was in my classroom was we just built our own PC, which you can get away with running it, you know, 500 bucks or so. But, you know, of course, the Oculus Rift is another 300 and the Vive a little more than that. But um, you can get into the game for a little bit less than what you did before. For teachers that are looking for a solution for like an entire lab, um, which we've been seeing more around Ohio and even Kentucky now, um, the schools around us have been using ByteSpeed. Um, they custom make rigs specifically made for VR, um, and then they ship you like a Vive with it kind of thing. Um, so I've seen them around, and they've been really good. I've had some phone calls with them, and they, they seem very personable, and they really have good service follow-up too. Um, and some people are even looking at doing multiple Vives in the same room. So this is at uh, one of Steve's mind fairs, actually, last fall at Philadelphia. 
um, with Foundry 10 there who um, supplied the, uh, the HTC Vive that I have in my classroom so that we could do this research, right? We're making it up as we go, Steve. We know we are. Yes. <laughs> um, but if you're going to do, yeah, teacher. Um, <laughs> if uh, if you're going to do multiple vibes, what we discovered was you really want, yeah, we really want to have, <clears throat> excuse me, some sort of visual curtain um, that will not bleed that light between it. So if you shine a laser light at it and you can see it on the other side, it's not going to work well because these sensors up here behind me, the vibe sensors, they work basically like the grocery store checkout, if I'm not mistaken, um, spinning around. Well, they used to be spinning, but now they're not. Um, so if you have multiples, you just have to have uh, light separation between them, and then you can do that. I wouldn't run them on the same computer, um, but you can do multiple vibes in one one space there. So that's what uh, this is uh, like a VR arcade, which we have one down the road. Um, if you're going to have separation between multiple VR setups, you have to at least in Ohio, I think it's three feet from the roof is what the fire code says. So don't put an artificial wall all the way up to the ceiling. I uh, got uh, in trouble for that one time. <laughs> so um, so whenever I go to talk to a group of teachers about, uh, yeah, Lisa, we have VR arcades. It's like the old school arcades. You pay by either like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour. Um, it's really interesting. And they just have those are popping up. Available. Yeah, they're popping up around us <clears throat> in Jersey too. Yeah, and 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 whatever it's funny because every market that I'm looking at for Mind Fair, I'm always looking at who's around for VR, and there's there they are everywhere. Right. With me. Yeah. Um. So when I go to the teachers, like, well, what am I really going to use this for? Because like Steve and I, we pretty much have the best job in the world. We get to yep. teach game design and mess with VR and be like, oh, I'm going to tinker with this headset and be like, hey, kids, I figured out something why don't you try something with it? And then we go on and explore something else. And we're both kind of AD. Yep. Steve's got his on there. Um, very meta, Steve. Um, <laughs> and, and so what do you talk about? Um, what do you do? Um, the logistically wise center base is about the way you have to go. Cause most people are going to have one, maybe two or three. Um, and I've seen some imp implementations where, uh, you isolate that one student that's in it and they do their thing within it. So like when my students are practicing a uh, presentation on the um, Samsung Gear VR, I have an old Samsung Galaxy that we put in there. Um, they That's an isolation scenario. But then the opposite of that would be having the one person that's in the headset kind of be the ringleader. And then the rest of the class with the teacher's Sherpa guiding is sort of saying, kind of guiding the person that's in here in the class is giving feedback on where they should go and where they should explore well, there, kind of there's thing. there's also some really cool um you know collaborative experiences like the uh don't uh keep talking and nobody explodes oh, you probably right. use that so the kids with that it's it's kind of neat you have um one kid's in the headset and they basically have a, a bomb in front of them and the goal is to disarm the bomb the other people which could be a number of kids have access to the manual and they're going through the manual um, page by page to kind of as the, the person with the bomb in front of them saying, you know, I see this, you know, what should I do? And they have to kind of talk back and forth to figure out how to do this. It's pretty neat. And there's, it's funny, too, because I guess there's a lot of like escape room type stuff is starting to pop up with um, VR. Really interesting to see it all unfold, actually. Um, sorry, I was just messaging in there. Um... You always want to have a chaperone because at least for this generation, we have the cables, et cetera, of course. Um, and as far as breaking immersion, uh, you don't let people screw with the other people in VR. It's just an absolute no-no. Um, they always want to do the jump scare kind of stuff. And we just completely outrule that. Um, so some of the things that I like to show teachers is um, in that video in the top right, I'll put a link down in the chat when Steve takes over, um, is actually something I did, interactive poetry. So. Um, I wrote poet. This is in Tilt Brush on the HTC Vive. Um, so it's painting in space, right? So instead of just making it an art thing, because that's the easy curricular connection, right? Is bringing it into the English language arts. So you're in this cave that I painted and you write words on the wall. And then the person who views your poetry has to look around objects symbolically, right? So things that are underneath things or on the underside of chairs, right? Have are part of the poetry, but it's completely interactive. 
Um, and then in this one, it kind of looks funky there, but you're actually a canary in a coal mine and there's a dragon in there and the canary is on the other side of this warp thing because it's finally escaping the canary in the coal mine. Um, and it's just something that I made up because I thought, man, what would I like to do if I was trying to write and experience poetry is give a visual to that poetry. And this is the first time where people could interact with your poetry that isn't a video and it's not static text. It's actually you're in a living, breathing world of sorts. It's not moving. So it's uh, anyways, um, engineering to mod box is like uh, if you've ever played Gary's mod or any game where you have like engines and gears and uh, different types of elastic joints and pivots and springs, you can assemble them all together to make contraptions of your design. So medieval um, launcher type thing. So one challenge I give my students is make me a launcher that will launch a watermelon 50 yards into a barrel 10 out of 10 times. Huh. Instead of just saying, and that's a Lucas Gillespie strategy, by the way, because he, he taught me that you can't just say, here, make uh, try making something that launches something because there's no metric, right? There's no measurable, right? So it's not enough to just hand them the VR and say, go be creative with it because they will and then they'll get overwhelmed or, you know, it just won't be anything great. Mm -hmm. So always delivering something with the, did I make it, right? Measurable yeah. thing. Um, and this is uh, our art teacher trying tilt brush for the first time in my classroom, which is really fun. Because hmm. um, then now we have, uh, is it Masterpiece VR, I think? Um, it's more like sculpting in clay. And so they're bringing their, um, well, they're, I don't know what they're called, sculpture class. And whatever they're making, the next step is you can export into the uh, 3D printer. So they're going to print off what they designed in VR. Mm -hmm. So we're in the middle of that right now. I don't know if it works, but it says it works. <laughs> um, so tune in next time there. Um, also, one interesting thing is that's my daughter in the top right. She's five. And according to Jesse Shell, who in my eyes is kind of the um, expert on this, right? He's a game designer, Carnegie Mellon professor, works with Disney or has worked with Disney on projects. He says that it's worse to read in low light than it is to use the VR headset. And so while I'm sure the lawyers say, well, you better be 12 or 15 or 80 years old before you can use this, um, he said it's fine. So those are my nieces and nephews and I in my classroom here, um, my siblings, uh, using VR. So it's it's really okay. And it's interesting, one quick thing. When she put on the VR headset, let me step back. When other people put on the VR headset, they have this, whoa look right and it, those of you that have done this have experienced this when she put it on it was a natural extension of her reality and she just giggled and started mm -hmm. painting and i didn't teach her any of it and i didn't want to i was just curious what she would do and it was just a neat experience that that was like well yeah that's normal their imagination is like that and i think we've lost that along the way and steve you talked about like fiddling with things and learning something and handing it off to a kid and i think we don't do enough of that so my brief soapbox is that if you're going to develop in VR or have kids create things, it's not to say, well, what's the curriculum? What are the measurables? And I shudder when I hear that because I think I, I have no idea. I don't even know what mm -hmm. I'm doing. We're kind of making it up as we go. So why don't we just learn with the kids and change that into a collaborative culture between us? Because then they start to trust us when we're like, oh, that didn't work. Oh, screwed that up. Um, it, it just it just kills the culture. As mm -hmm. soon as you turn it into, okay, lessons one, two, and three, you're going to do this, okay? And then three, four, and five, it, you might as well use this textbook at that point. If you're going to do something like this, embrace the yep. pedagogy, well, I guess. Go ahead. I mean, one of the, just along those lines too, and the reason I'm so fond of that approach um, is I think for one, I mean, it's it's authentic, right? Like I'm excited about learning. The kids get to see that. Um, we're modeling that, um, sitting down next to a kid, you know, doing that. I mean, I think they you know, kind of really enjoy that. And then we've started to notice that, you know, when the kids bring in an air, a level of expertise, think of how empowering that is for them and they teach us or teach their peers. It's totally, um, it's amazing because standardized tests, I don't think know how to measure that, uh, which is a crying shame really, but, but I, it's the way it's, it's, yeah. it's so awesome. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I have here is, um, I don't even know what this app is really, but if your students are going to be creating things, don't let them try to recreate what they already know. Like, don't try to create, oh, this is um, 
like just having a bunch of information on a wall in VR, because at first it'll be novel because it's the technology. But as soon as that wears off, the experience better support it, mm -hmm. right? There needs to be a reason compelling to stay in there and do it. Um, so we play different VR apps and we have figured out what do the good apps do? What are the really popular ones doing? And one of the things is don't have static things like this. When we make an interface, um, like the guy that's doing the change the car, the car tire app, his interface is not like on your face, like, oh, I need to do these steps. It's literally a clipboard that you have to pick up and flip the pages mm. to look at the different steps using the technology for um, really what you can do with it as opposed to what we're used to, which is 2D surfaces, right? Menus can be switches and levers, et cetera. So takeaways. <laughs> I have none, Steve. How about you? No, I'm hoping that the audience might have some. Um, oh. Also, definitely open to to questions. Uh, you know, I think we I think we're at a good time for that. We have uh, we have two questions, and I put both of them in there. If anybody else has one, they can ask. I really do want to know this. Um, have you guys done any building using Google Blocks app yet? And then, or, and or are you importing from Google Poly as part of that whole virtual world building? Um, it's interesting. I'm not familiar with Google Poly, but we have been playing around with blocks a bit, um, which, you know, it's, it's interesting to me. The, uh, you know, there are a few tools like that, uh, that, you know, I've been using something also called 3D Sunshine, which I like a lot. And that allows kids to build with like blocks in VR. Um, Google, I, you know, Google Blocks is, is, interesting because I still personally, and, and maybe Mark has a different feeling on this, I feel like, um, it, you know, it came out as being fairly new recently, but Tilt Brush, I think, still offers a, a much more immersive experience so far. And I, Have yeah. you had similar thoughts or different? Yeah, and um, along the lines of Tilt Brush, Lisa, I just heard your question about sharing out of Tilt Brush. Yes. Um, that's my second question. So the the video that I uh, am going to link here shortly before I forget, um, that was just screencast-o-matic, web-based um, screen capture. And I just kind of acted it out what the person would see. And so that's what I have teachers do is because you can't bring the teacher in to grade every student's thing in the VR necessarily. So each kid actually becomes kind of a uh, producer of their own video then, and they just have to screen capture and then walk through what they would envision that person uh, the okay, user. so the the, the, the tilt brush is hooked up to the monitor, and while it's displaying on the monitor, you're doing Correct. screen capture. Correct. Okay. Yes, and you can share your designs, and there is some multiplayer cool. aspect to it. But I don't have any friends, and so <laughs> I haven't been able <laughs> I haven't been able to share that. I don't know if there's something blocked or what, but I'll be your friend, Mark. Oh, thanks, Steve. The Google Poly is Google's new library for 3D objects, so you don't have to build everything from scratch. That's if their you're... warehouse, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just downloaded the Google Blocks on the, I have an Oculus Rift I just got at home. So that's next on my agenda, but I can't speak to that. Well, it was just when you were talking about building in Unity and the different, all the SketchUp and all the different apps that integrate for importing yeah. and exporting objects. That's yeah. when I asked that question. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many different things to try to see what works with other things. It's really it's, interesting. It changes fast. Um, Enrique asked, how do you see the technology penetrating the average classroom in the future? That's, I mean, that's a great question. And I think that's, uh, I, well, I think on one hand, um, I think we are seeing the costs go down. I think there was a period of time where it seemed absolutely cost prohibitive to do much with VR. So <laughs> we do have a few issues, though. There's still the high system requirements um, for a computer to run, the higher end. So you know, it, it comes down to that whole thing about can we get um, experiences that are really going to be rich with something like Google Cardboard? And there are other in our school. I think we have the um, there's a set of the what's the other one? It's like Google Cardboard, whatever. But but um, the so so we're starting to see some of that, um, you know, and I still think we're going to be at a point for a while where the higher end stuff is going to be more like we've been using sort of, you know, available as a resource. My, my approach to, to teaching though, is to provide resources to kids. So in my room, you know, the resources are there. It doesn't mean that everybody's, you know, like, so only one person could be on each device at a time, but they're actually 
there are times when none of them are being used because the kids are engaged in other activities. So when they just knowing that they're available to them, I think is a great approach. And I hope to see that other classes find a way to do that. Um, I was just talking to a, a history teacher today who wants to come in and do there's a pyramid um, experience. So her question, of course, was, can I do it on the equipment? You know, can I do it in my classroom? And it's only on Vive right now. So we're trying to figure out how to to make that work. Um, but I think I, I think we'll get there. Companies like that um, Byte Speed are coming up with, you know, they have a solution to, you know, sort of outfit a lab with X number of devices and how schools really decide to, to use them or not. We'll see. Um, but I think we're a long way from <laughs> from having a setup where everybody's doing something in VR at the same time. Yeah. Oh, that's disappointing. That was a question I had. Yeah. I mean, again, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we're talking about the price point stuff, right? Like, right. If, you know, I, I think if we were dealing with because even then you get into the other side of it, which is like the mid range. I think we need. Well, actually, OK. Oculus is coming out with a standalone. This might also address uh, Enrique's other question, perhaps. Oculus is coming out with a $200 solution that's a standalone um, product that my hope is that that will exceed like the mid-range or, or, or really meet that same range as, say, the Gear VR. Because the Gear VR, sadly, is so proprietary that you know, you're not going to find a solution where you can get a class set of the of Samsung phones for that because the phone is like $7,800. Wow. So I'm interested to see what happens with this next round of like, I think it's called Oculus Go and it's going to retail for $200. That might be the answer. Mm. Uh, Man, this is so cool. I can make a whole college class out of just what you guys talked about tonight. <laughs> I think it's going to be my next class in the fall. <laughs> Sweet. I want to be a student in it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm looking... hiring you guys as adjunct instructors. Oh, I can't sweet. do it on my own. <laughs> I was just looking in uh, Unity real quick because, um, Enrico, you were asking about exporting to the mobiles and VRTK, the Virtual Reality Toolkit, which, again, is the plugin that's free for Unity um, that allows my students and I to make these experiences, um, supports Daydream, Google Daydream as well. Um, and that looks like about the only mobile one that's named anyways in here. Mm. The uh, Robin, Robin was asked, actually. Robin asked, do the higher end headsets yeah. get away from using cell phones? Yeah, they don't use cell phones, but they're the ones that require a higher end computer to run. So, you know, it's a, you know, you're right now, those are our challenges. Now, you know, the way computer prices go and everything, if the, if the VR hardware doesn't feel like it has to still stay ahead of, you know, the, the CPU, you know, we'll get to a point soon where a reasonably normal priced computer will run them. But right now we're at a point where the um, the graphics card you would need to run, you know, either the Oculus or the Vive is pretty intense. So you are pricing yourself out. And what, what's real frustrating is, you know, you might have a beautiful computer lab in your school and think, hey, I'll get one of these, you know, headsets and it won't work on what you have. So I've already had to build two new computers to accommodate you know, the, the, right. the cost is really prohibitive. Have you guys tried the HoloLens yet? I I've, have it the, uh, uh, the over the summer and I love the concept, but it felt like an alpha simply because of the limited window was so uh, engaging because as you would move around, it would crop off or trim mm -hmm. parts of the images. Oh, I noticed that. And I didn't think about it till you mentioned it. Um, and Jesse Shell's opinion on that, by the way, is that, that is going to be a, a science limitation for another 10 years on that technology. Wow. That's just what he said at the last conference I was at. Um, yeah. Another practical thing for teachers that are going to be doing any kind of VR thing is sanitation. So kids, when you have the VR headset here, you want a wipeable, cleanable surface. This is an aftermarket uh, uh, cushion here for the HTC Vive. Mm -hmm. the, the one that it ships with is this kind of foamy thing and that soaks up sweat and makeup and everything else and actually i didn't realize but the whole first semester i had a low percentage of girls that were interested in doing this and come to find out they didn't want their makeup smearing off on the headset or they're self-conscious about something i don't know but now hmm. that we've got this and our hair our hair messing up our hair yes and your hair 
Um, <laughs> we just keep a bottle of uh, like rubbing alcohol and cotton swabs, and they know the drill. As soon as they take it off, they grab that, wipe it down. Mm -hmm. Next person, you don't put it on right away because the evaporation would burn your eyes. But <laughs> it is that is a challenge. Um, it you know it drives me crazy. I, what I can't imagine. So, like Six Flags has a roller coaster, or oh, did that you ooh. you ride with the um, the Samsung gear, and I'm thinking, how do they handle that as right. The thing comes off. Are they cleaning them every time before the next group? And I don't know. Just seemed very odd and didn't seem really like it would make all that much sense where we are right now with this stuff. Yeah, that's just wow. kind of like the initial wave. I think. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, guys, for being here and sharing what you're doing. And I love the back and forth. Did you spend a lot of time planning that out, or what? it just I, I'd say it just flowed. It's like you guys so, are the yeah. cart. Remember the car guys. That had their life uh, go. Yeah, the NPR guys. Yeah, you guys could be like the car <laughs> guys on <in> webinars. <laughs> That'd be great. No, I think we've just, uh, you know, it's, it's just a thing. It's a, it's a, we share a brain. <laughs> yeah, left and right. Yep. <laughs> All right, and then uh, Steve, do you want to uh, pitch your uh, tweet chat tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So tonight um, at eight p.m. Eastern. The games for Ed hashtag games for Ed chat. I'm going to be moderating and um, hoping Mark will be around because it's a topic uh, near and dear to his heart as well. But we're talking about uh, game clubs and competitive gaming in school. So Mark's not going to be able to make. You knew it, I was uh, going to the sound of music tonight. Oh really? Well, that sounds lovely. Um, <laughs> Can't wait. Be better, you but... know, um, Chris Haskell just came on campus to give a talk on esports, and then our esports club ran its game fest over the weekend. So I got my first full immersion into a college esports club event gameplay. I was actually welcomed and given free T-shirts and nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm that's really awesome. interested to hear what that's looking like in schools. Yeah, yeah, we're super excited about it. I mean. You know, it's a kind of a no brainer at this point, um, but it is it's been something I've been real passionate about. Um, I had my game club today, in fact, right before this, as if I didn't have enough going on today. And so, um, you know, I entered this with a big headache from 30 kids screaming uh, as they're playing Super Smash Brothers and what have you. But <laughs> but, you know, yep. I, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> All right. I appreciate you guys. I can't wait to see you again whenever that's going to be. And um Man, just want to stay in touch with what you're doing because it's it's like the cool kid stuff, you know. <laughs> well, there's our contact info if anybody needs to get a hold of us. Um, Thank you for bringing that up again. Appreciate it. And um, we'll as soon as the video comes out, we'll upload it to YouTube. We'll send you the link and share it with all your friends. Yeah, and thanks everybody who did join us today. Nice to see some familiar faces in the in the crowd there. Yeah. Appreciate. Yeah. It. Thanks to all our guests, everybody who's watching in the future. And again, thanks to Beatrix. This is our very final episode. We're shutting off. It was a great semester of webinars and she put a lot of work in. So I know <laughs> I was just like, we're just getting in a flow, right? I know. All well, right. Guys. Started up again in uh, January, right? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care. Really right. good to see you bye guys. Bye. Thanks for having Thank us. So much. Really appreciate you. Bye. Bye.